you are listening to the English version of a Vietnamese podcast to share with the world part of our work that focuses on the intersectionality of women-led climate change initiatives and gender equality. It has been edited for length and clarity. <coughs> When I brought the asparagus to Sandy Soy here, everyone said this lady was crazy. Asparagus cannot be planted in sandy soil. I told them I would grow it as an experiment because it can be profitable. People can earn from seventy to eighty thousand for only one kilogram of asparagus. So despite what people said, I do what I wanted. Chou Ti Xiao is a farmer of the Cham ethnic minority. Since 2016, the pioneer woman has been making waves for being the first person in her commune to grow asparagus and come up with a unique grow system for it on semi-desert sandy soil in Ninh Thuận province in south and central Vietnam. Hello, I'm San Nguyen. You are listening to The Descendants of Hai Ba Chung, brought to you by the United Nations Development Program in Vietnam. It is where Vietnamese women from diverse backgrounds and professions, farmers, researchers, climate advocates, and others share their experiences of tackling the stereotype which say that women are more often seen as victims of climate change and less so as change makers. Their fierce action in addressing and adapting to impacts of climate change with indigenous knowledge, scientific evidence, community values, justice and empathy inspire a more sustainable world for us all. In this episode, Chum farmer Chou Ti Xiao shows us how unstoppable she is with her asparagus idea despite all sorts of everyday life and systematic challenges that female farmers, especially those from ethnic minority backgrounds like her, face. Now the founder and director of the Jose General Agricultural Service Cooperative, how has this woman mobilized all the Chum woman farmers and radicalized the agricultural landscape in her community? When Sal gave me a tour, it reveals the cool lush greenery that stretches her 1.7 hectare farm. You see the influence of asparagus all over, not because it covers her farm, but because of earnings from growing it. Sal has been able to color her farm with coconuts, bananas, and papaya trees, which also provide shade for her noisy cattle and livestock. The strong wind rattled her asparagus as she pointed at them is a reminder of the harsh climate, how blisteringly hot and super windy it is in Ning Thuận province. Sal first came up with the idea because there was another farmer in a nearby commune growing asparagus and she began visiting them and asking them all sorts of questions. The weather where she is is not kind, forcing both farmers and the asparagus to work with scarce natural resources like water, which is even more challenging, especially in the context of increasingly erratic droughts exacerbated by climate change. Growing asparagus here is very difficult since we don't have favorable weather conditions. The water is also scarce since it's cave ground water, forcing people to install an economical irrigation pipe. So we should only plant a small number of asparagus to ensure the irrigation process. In the past, there was more rain, so it was easier for farmers. But now, there are more sunny days than rainy ones which makes it difficult for us to farm. Where I live, it's all abandoned land and full of cactus thorns. No one came here, only I did. So whatever I grew on this land was very unstable. I also get haggled hard when I do business with private traders. I can only earn two to three thousand Vietnam dong for every 10,000 Vietnam dong they sell. But with asparagus, I can earn so much more with this one pack of asparagus alone, I can earn from 50,000 to 60,000 Vietnam dong. The sprouting of asparagus piqued the interest of fellow farmers and spelled the beginning of Jose Cooperative and the community of Chum people growing asparagus together. But convincing people to form a cooperative was not easy. 
If I hadn't followed the cooperative model, the state wouldn't have supported me to plant asparagus. Then, I took a class on cooperative law in 2012 and held a meeting to inform farmers about it. At first, people didn't understand. They said that if they joined the cooperative, their land would be taken, like in the subsidy period. So people didn't really like it. It took me two or three times to explain that this cooperative would not take land or take anything from them. We only needed seven people or more to form a cooperative. And this cooperative is self-made, self-sufficient, nobody's land will be taken. Then we got it registered. Initially, there were only 737 households. Then I went to the state to register to establish a cooperative, and then we started to plant asparagus. At first, only those who had money could plant asparagus. After that, the cooperative financially supported those who could not afford it. I personally borrowed money from the bank. There was a district chairman who helped me borrow 500 million dong from Ningfuk Agricultural Bank. Up to now, there are 30 households that grow asparagus and the other 73 households plants melons or peaches and other things. Some households have benefited from the cooperative by borrowing money to buy seedlings and others who have not had the capital, they will join later. I want to help all of them, but I don't have the money either. The asparagus success is not a flick of a finger. The very first row of asparagus takes at least six months of meticulous care. Farmers in rural areas like Seo are not only concerned by the financial resources needed to grow asparagus and the condition of the plants themselves, they also have to arrange an entire infrastructure for them to grow and be distributed sustainably. That includes building roads and borrowing electricity from a neighbor. It was very, very difficult. There was no road and the land was not even, and we rented bulldozers to level the land. Then we mobilized people to donate and to make roads. We did everything. The commune gave us 350 million dong to build the road and the Tian Tian farm gives us electricity from solar energy. Ever since the cooperative establishment, we have had roads and electricity. Apart from a rough start, global crises like the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all trying to recover from are a huge blow to the chum farmers of the Jose cooperative. But when COVID came, some people started to chop down asparagus. I tried to buy it to feed the goats and the cows. Then I tried to encourage people not to chop it anymore. And I spent about 300 to 400 million in three or four months just to buy their asparagus. They finally stopped chopping it. And since this January, they has resumed growing and harvesting again. Everyone was demotivated at that time of COVID. Now the road is clear, COVID is gone. They can go back to do it again. There's nothing like asparagus. Her community's areas in Fukai commune, according to Seo, is 100 hectares, while asparagus have only been planted on about one-fifth the land. Farmers in her cooperative plant crops around the same time and come up with strategies for a strong and uniform growth. Here, people are encouraged to use organic fertilizers, goat manure and cow dung. Every household in this area has goats and cows. We can utilize every part of the asparagus and feed goats and cows. The cows and the goats eat them and then they produce manure. Then we can use it to fertilize the asparagus. But when we had no experience, a lot of plants died because of chemical fertilizers, NPK fertilizers with a lot of urea. So now people don't do that anymore. Now most people use manure. 
When it's sick, we cut the plant and spread lime on it. The asparagus here now is very clean. When people here harvest the asparagus and find a broken one, they eat it right away, right on the spot as breakfast. Because that is how clean our asparagus is. Sal is a decorated farmer. Her office is embellished with certificates of merit given to her by the chairman of the province People's Committee and the Women's Union for her achievement with asparagus and mobilizing chum farmers to join in and increase their economic profile. The produce not only creates jobs for the chum farmers in Sal's commune, but also enriches the meals of people elsewhere after being sold in wholesale markets in Saigon, Dalat, Hanoi, and in restaurants and supermarkets in her locality. But 20 years ago, Sel chose the land where she is living now, about half an hour by a motorbike from the main village, not because of its fertility or asparagus potential, but for a very personal reason. Her husband was an alcoholic at the time, and she decided to move out to this barren land and hoped that the distance and space could help him recover. I brought my husband here to quit drinking. I drilled a well and I saw how beautiful the water was, so I liked it. When I came here alone, the land here was original and unexploited. I also grew melon trees for seeds. People left the wasteland, I came to live on it. I plowed the land to grow melons, I grew black beans, I grew so many things. Every came here also asked me why I didn't go back to the village, why I lived in such sandy soil and hot weather. Everyone came here to tell me to go back to the village, but I didn't go back. Before we grew asparagus, the people who worked on the fields were all men. And since planting asparagus, women also joined the men. Early in the morning, couples go harvesting asparagus, removing lawn weeds, and do everything together. Because now both the husband and the wife work on the asparagus together, I call it the plan of happiness. When there was no asparagus, men worked little and got drunk throughout the day. Now they have to dr drive their wives to the harvest, the asparagus at, at 3 or 4 or 5 a.m. and work until 9 a.m. Then they have to take care of the cattle and pluck the weeds as well. Now, wherever women are par participating, asparagus are clean and beautiful and a lot can be harvested. Asparagus that is cared by only men and without the participation of women have low productivity. So ever since you grow the asparagus, has it also been your plant of happiness? Yes, my husband didn't work on asparagus before, so uh, he had time to drink alcohol. He was already drunk early in the morning. Now my family is a role model. Together we are committed. He used to have too much free time, so he kept going out to drink alcohol. Now my husband and I work together and do everything together. He stopped drinking. He, I just named the plan the happiest plan of my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big smile you got there. <laughs> <laughs> when I first opened the cooperative, the men sat at a cafe and talked badly about women. They doubted that women could do anything and said like, how could women run a cooperative? They did not have faith in us women. When we succeeded, they were rooted to the spot. They were so surprised at what women could do. Women stick together in Cell Asparagus Cooperative. One of the women she attributed to her success is Chen Du Ang, now a specialist on climate change and women's economic empowerment at the UNDP Vietnam. Machilini and gender stereotype vary from place to place. But in matriarchal localities, by default, people think women hold great power and there is nothing uh, to be worried about when it comes to gender equality. So what does cell story show us? It is believed that women uh, have more power in the locality. Men do not have to do anything. Therefore, so much burden has fallen 
on the woman's shoulder. For many people, empowerment often starts with access to knowledge and resources. Sel told me she met up with SNV Netherlands Development Organization, a Dutch nonprofit, who provided her and other farmers with gender equality workshops and training on how to manage a cooperative. But the empowerment mechanism requires many actors to work together. Tức là khi mà chị bọn chị uh, UNDP vào triển khai. When UNDP went to Ninh Thuận to implement the project. Uh, there are all men in the program planning and monitoring unit in the province. Those men with no experience in women's economic empowerment or how to include gender equality, also the role of the ethnic minorities uh, women in the activities. They probably know the quantitative aspect of things. Uh, for example, the percentage of women who need to attend the training class, but they did not know Uh, or have any insights into the real substance of women's empowerment. So when we were in Ninh Thuận, we took the unit to visit the best Muro, which is only 15 kilometers away from where the unit was. There was the first time they met Miss Sell in her fields and worked with her. The male officers, especially the head of the department, were very enthusiastic and they said, Wow, this is so great. How come I did not know about this before? From then, they started to invite Mrs. Sell to different capacity. In my opinion, it is also the province's idea and determination, not just the effort of UNDP and others. The province also see that the work like that of Mrs. Sell need to be replicated and be heard and learned from the others. Uh, for example, how She mobilizes people how any minorities can help initiative to cope with the difficulties of uh, droughts, of the water shortages, and disease like COVID, for example. That's first step. Um, then it is not about keeping the opportunity to your uh, provinces, uh, but also sharing this uh, experience uh, to the others. And Mrs. Seo was also involved and she was very enthusiastic because she feels that she is a person who can contribute a lot. That's the point I think that is important, especially considering that we, what, we, uh, what we, we hope and what she gained from has been reached by her own experience. The results of this project come not just from organization staff, but also by the ethnic minority women. They want to share it with many others. On one hand, uh, we want farmers to take the initiative, but on the other hand, I also wish that farmers do not suffer too much. I think that uh, mechanism for sharing risk and responsibility is very important for organizations to think about when they develop the programs. Uh, we often integrated ideas that have been successful elsewhere into the local community and sometimes we ignore the responsibility of the uh, sharing responsibility of us or of the organization to share the farmers burden in trying something new. Cells belong to the Cham that is one of the 54 ethnic groups in Vietnam. While it is important not to paint all minority ethnic groups with the same brush It is common that ethnic minority women in remote and rural areas lack equal access to land and capital, and this makes it difficult for them to make decisions and solve problems that they live close with and have deep understanding of. Discrimination and social isolation also reduce their access to legal representation or protection. Duang told me that Sell's example challenges the typical stereotypes of ethnic minorities in Vietnam and provide a more nuanced understanding of their lived experience. How did she become such a role model? Uh, she went to Hanoi Front Conference, the pre-COP conference, and she brought the voice of real ethnic minority uh, people. After all, she's a chum. Her husband is a chum, and she lives in a community of 100% chum people. People 
listen to the story of ethnic and um, indigenous people with great interest. Their story is special. Before the prejudice against the ethnic minorities, I mean, they would be thought of its association with the culture, identity, and the beautiful mountains they live in. And people tend to forget that being an ethnic uh, also comes with a great energy and initiative, not just the matter of culture, landscape, or nature. A uh, social norm that people just assume that they were this thing. Uh, and make uh, clothes and also have special dances and also particular the musical uh, instrument and that's all, uh, all about the uh, ethnic minority people but also that is not but not what uh, Miss Sell and Cham community bring they do things that bring profit for the economy they can bring the idea that affect the policy from the point of view of the ethnic people that great meanings that go beyond contributing their voice. Sel became a household name because of her asparagus initiative and her efforts in empowering other Cham women in her community. But to the 61-year-old woman, the ups and downs with her asparagus cooperative is part of a turbulent life where she survived wartime poverty. If I didn't go to school, I wouldn't have been able to do all that. At that time, I went to a socialist school, and thanks to them, I tried my best. At that time, thanks to the government, I was taught farming techniques to make a living. I want to do something to repay the country for my people to benefit from it. Uncle Ho said that no job is hard if one's will is enduring. Even digging down the mountain or filling up the ocean can be done by one's will. No matter how hard it is, we have to try our best. I am very poor. My family has many brothers and sisters, but I do everything with empty hands, so that's why I work hard. Thank you, Jyoti Sel and Chan Du Ain, for your incredibly infectious energy. You have just listened to the podcast Descendants of Haba Chung, brought to you by the United Nations Development Program, where we share inspiring stories about women from diverse backgrounds and professions and their fierce action to combat the climate crisis and build the resilience of the communities and ecosystems to the impacts of climate change. I'm Sen Nguyen. Don't forget to share, spread the word, let us know what you think, and I'll see you in the next episode.